Well, welcome to New Hope Church. I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you're visiting today for the first time, I'm just going to do a really quick catch-up on where we've been and where we're going. So we've been working our way through the book of Revelation through the year. And uh, the month of October, the theme for October that I shared with my small group on Wednesday is big steps. We're going to take some big steps in October. So last week, our big step was all of chapter 14, okay? And this week, we're going to do chapters 15 and 16, okay? And so those are big steps. I don't, uh, I don't pretend they're not. But as you look at them, you're going to see chapter 15 is only eight verses, and chapter 15 and 16 uh, are linked together. They're very much linked together, and it would almost not make sense to separate them. Uh, so this big step that we're going to take today, I think, is... is uh, the chapters aren't inspired, okay? But the Word of God is. Let's just look at it that way. Uh, today, what we're going to do, uh, last week you kind of left with an outline of the chapter for your study. This week, we're going to look at three main principles that I see in chapters 15 and 16 of Revelation. The other thing that I'm going to do, just because it can get, it's a big chunk of Scripture, so I'm going to read it all, but then when I reference it, I won't, I won't read through it again, but we'll have it up on the on the overhead, so you can follow along, or uh, you'll, I'll mention the verses that I'm referencing, but just to not reread all of it as I work through it. So we're going to be in Revelation 15. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to jump into this book. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, the, the, the way that you've given us to work through this text, the way that we can have that blessing that you talked about in the first chapter and in hearing, uh, reading, and keeping this book because the time is short. We know that, Lord. And so today as we look into these chapters, God, would you reveal these principles that you want to share and uh, Holy Spirit, have freedom here. Bring uh, encouragement to those of us that need encouragement. Bring conviction to those of us that need conviction. And ultimately, Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to have freedom here and for this word today to accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to read chapters 15 and 16. I'll be reading in the ESV, so if it's, if it's easier for you to just listen, that's fine. Uh, if, it's, if it's not easy to follow along. Chapter 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what happened, I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sang, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, who will not fear O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are worthy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is, who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve." And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. 
The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled... They assembled them at the place in Hebrew that is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was the earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great, to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. Big step. Big step today. So I'm not going to read through all of those sections again as I cover them, but I want to talk about these three principles that we see through these. So we'll put the scriptures up on on the overhead while I'm talking about it. But the first thing that we see, if you're taking notes on your bulletin or or on the app, is uh, to warm up with worship. To warm up with worship. So this is verses 1 through 8 of chapter 15. It's all of chapter 15. Okay. So chapter 15 is all about preparation. Chapter 15 is all about preparation. Remember uh, last week we saw that the wrath of God is being prepared full strength. Okay, So there's this preparation that's happening. Seven angels have their bowls of the plagues of the wrath of God. And there's so many parallels between these bowls and the plagues uh, that were released in the, in the Exodus in, the, in Egypt. So I'm going to give you a little bit of homework in a minute here. But This is a good one for you to maybe dig into. Again, we're taking bigger steps. It's a good one for you to look into on your own as you look at some of the parallels between these bowls and the plagues that were sent out into Egypt before the Exodus. This wrath that's coming is full strength. We said that last week. And and we said what that meant was that there's no grace that dilutes it and there's no mercy that dilutes it. Okay? Okay? Before these bowls of wrath are poured out, there's a worship session that needs to happen. There's a worship session that needs to happen. And they're worshiping the Lord, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So the song of Moses is Exodus chapter 15. So I recommend you just make a note to read that. And when you're reading that, it's going to make way more sense if you refresh yourself on Exodus chapter 14 first. So 14 will lead right into 15, and it's going to really help you understand the picture of what they're singing about in Exodus 15, what Moses is singing about. But it's this great song giving praise and glory to God for the deliverance from the oppressive rule of Pharaoh. That's what Exodus 15 is all about. In this portion of Revelation 15, they're singing this song mixed with the song of the Lamb who has freed them from the oppressive rule of Satan through the Antichrist, right? We saw that authority was transferred. So they're singing this song to to praise the Lamb as well for removing them from that oppressive rule. So uh, I'm reading, as I'm studying this, a book that Greg Lowry wrote um, about the book of Revelation, and he had some parallels that are really neat, I think. I love when you see this in Scripture, and we can draw these out. So here's some parallels from Greg Lowry's book. He says, the song of Moses is a song of triumph over Pharaoh. The song of the Lamb is a song of triumph over the Antichrist. The song of Moses is how God brought his people out. The song of the Lamb is about how God brought his people in. The song of Moses is the first song in the Scriptures, and the song of the Lamb is the last song in the Scriptures. It's just kind of cool when you see some of those things that, that God did in his word. There's another aspect, though, that's displayed in this idea of singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. 
And uh, I think we have to put on our first century audience hats to, to really wrap our heads around this, right? So when they hear the song of Moses, those folks are thinking the law, right? The idea of the law. Moses representing the law and the lamb being the fulfillment of the law. Does that make sense? So they're singing the law, the fulfillment of the law. That, that idea that we saw earlier in chapters 4 and 5 that the lamb was the only one found worthy in all of heaven. And if you remember when we talked about that, I said, you know, John, as he's looking around for who's, who's worthy to open the scroll, he was probably like, Moses, dude, can you crack this thing open? And Moses is like, no, I can't. I can't. So they find this one that's worthy to take back ownership. So they're worshiping Jesus for that. They're singing the song of the Lamb. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So Jesus came in fulfillment of the law, and part of him fulfilling this law is this judgment that's coming. That's what's important for us to understand. There's a couple of aspects in this song that they're worshiping Jesus for as they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. They worship his deeds in verse 3. They worship the truth of his ways in verse 3. They worship him for his holiness in verse 4. These are some of the, the aspects, some of the characteristics that they're praising him for in this warm-up to what's about to happen. And in all of it, it's underpinned by just this. Sometimes we just have to stop and acknowledge God for His holiness and His might and His transcendence. And this has that tone of that, that they're just underpinning all of this with recognition of God. Just a reverence and a recognition. He's about to bring about His wrath full strength on the earth. Full strength. Verse 7 says, that God is the only one who can be in the sanctuary until this is over. No one else can come in there because of the smoke that filled the sanctuary. We're going to see that God himself is the one who gives the angels the command to pour out the bowls. This is good for us to know. It's good for us to know. I said this earlier in this series that sometimes it makes us very uncomfortable to associate God with judgment. It makes us very uncomfortable sometimes, but there is no other way to cut this. There is no other way to cut this. This is the culmination of God's judgment. These folks are warming up with worship, looking at who they are worshiping and what he is about to do and the truth and the holiness of God. So how many of you are aware that I help out coaching football at the high school? Some of you know that. I coach primarily ninth and 10th graders. And uh, they get to the locker room about an hour before the game. Okay? And the deal is, hey, get in here. You know, kind of let's, let's forget about school for right now. Let's forget about stuff you're up to with your friends. Let's just kind of let's get our minds set. Let's start to get emotionally prepared, physically prepared to go play football. Okay? Football, is a pre- it's a pretty rough game. Okay? So you need some time to prepare. You have to get your mind right. You have to get your body right. And I'll just say, these are great kids. They're wonderful kids. But the scene in the locker room that I'm witnessing is a lot different than the scene in the locker room when I was in high school. It's just different. I don't know how else to say it. When I was in high school, we would come into the locker room and we would listen to some music, but it was usually like something that made you want to like rip somebody's head off, right? Okay. Okay. Just being straight with you. I'm just being straight with you. There is the music out there. If you're unfamiliar with it, it it exists. But a lot of us were mostly silent, honestly. Like, a lot of us were mostly silent. And we were just trying to get focused. And if we were talking, it was like, hey, uh, on this play, I go here and you go there. And what do I do and what do you do? And stuff like that. And it was interesting. uh, A few weeks ago, I was in the locker room. And the kids were in there and they were getting ready and they're listening to like love songs. And I went out there and I said, guys, 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 
this is not what we're doing here. This is not how you get ready to play football. You know, and they're like, oh, it's such and such. He's got, he Bluetooth into that. Well, get, take his phone away. That's not what we're listening to. It's just funny. It's just funny because we have to understand that we got to start off on the right foot. We got to start off on the right foot. And this, this principle is, that, is, is what chapter 15 is all about. God is making it known uh, that these last judgments are about to be carried out full strength. Full strength. On the entirety of the remaining world. There's a recognition of, about, of what is about to happen and, and a recognition that what is about to happen is right and true. Whether we agree with it or not. It's right and it's true. And the events that we're going to look at in chapter 16 as we progress through this message are right and true. And there's a principle for us. There's a principle for us uh, that there's a battle happening all around us. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but there's a battle happening all around us. And my question to you, as you think about this principle of chapter 15 of Revelation, is what are you doing to warm up? What are you doing to prepare your heart? What are you doing to prepare yourself emotionally? What are you doing to prepare yourself spiritually, mentally? I'm submitting to you that what we're learning here from chapter 15 is that we are to worship. To worship. That's how we warm up. That's how we warm up. Worship and prayer, yes. Worship in fellowship, yes. Worship spending time in God's Word, yes. Over and over and over in this book, we have seen worship in song. Don't miss that. Because some of you might say, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, and guess what? God doesn't care. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Over and over and over, we see these we see creatures, we see elders, we see angels, we see martyrs, we see all of these people singing praise and worship to the Lord. Do you find yourself doing this? Do you warm up with worship? Do you make worship a priority, not just here at church, but as part of your daily life? Do you warm up with worship. Number two, if you're taking notes here, judgment is justice. Judgment is justice. This is verses 1 through 7 in chapter 16. I'm going to quickly move through these first three bowls because if you look at your text, you'll see Scripture moves through them pretty quickly too. So I don't feel a need to spend a whole bunch of time talking about each of these bowls. But the first bowl we see causes painful sores. And if you have the NIV, you have the words ugly and festering. Right? Ugly, festering sores. Ick. These things are nasty. The second bowl is poured out, causes the waters of the sea to turn to uh, blood like the blood of a corpse. Remember... I think it was last week I talked about how I was on that tank volume calculator trying to figure out how many gallons of blood are in a human body and how many to get the four feet or five feet and all that stuff. Here's the other thing I did this week, looked into. If I, if, I'm telling you right now, <clears throat> if, if my computer were ever seized for something and the Google searches came up, I was, I was looking into what, what happens to blood after a person dies. And they were talking about how it, when the oxygen goes away, it turns a purple. So you're talking about these deep, the sea is turned into this deep, dark, purple blood like blood of a corpse. Okay? That's an image. Every living thing in the sea dies. Imagine all of the life in the sea, gone. Third bowl does basically the same thing to the rivers and the springs of fresh water. <clears throat> and these, if you remember, these sound just like the second and third trumpets that cause this same thing to happen to how much of the water? One third. One third. 
Do you remember those trumpets? Here it's the entirety of the earth receiving this bold judgment. All the waters on the earth are now affected. And I want to look at one thing here. These two angels confirm and agree that the judgment are just and true. These judgments are confirmed that they are just and true. There's a sense here that a biblical principle is being demonstrated by these angels confirming that these judgments are just and true. And it's this point, it's as if where God says, okay, if you want that, you can have that. If you want that, you can have that. You want a mark? I'll give you a mark. You want the blood of the saints? Here it is. You want that? You can have that. And it's all you're going to have. And the question that we ask is, why? Why? Seems a little harsh. <clears throat> Jesus helped us understand this principle that I'm saying that, that is being demonstrated that we see played out here in Matthew 7, uh, 1 and 2. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Very familiar verses, right? Very familiar verses, often uh, used or abused one way or another, right? Some people will say, don't judge me, right? Others will say, I have to judge you, right? Okay. I did a sermon on that uh, about a year ago. So I'm not going to go into all those principles, but if you go on our YouTube channel, you can find it. It's awesome. You should totally watch it twice. <clears throat> you, should, you should like and subscribe. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. yeah hit the thumbs up. Yeah. But God is bringing this uh, just judgment on the people who have failed to judge themselves rightly. That's what's happening here. They have been judged with the judgment that they've pronounced. And the angels confirm that this is right and true. Is it harsh? Yes. Is it final? Yes. Yes, it is. But it is still right and true. You might be asking yourself, why does all of this have to happen? Why does God have to carry out these judgments? And it's because God has said from the beginning that there will be a consequence for sin. He said from the beginning there's a consequence for sin. And there have been ample warnings there have been countless times given to repent and be saved. God is love, yes. God is also judge. There's this, kind of this part in the book of John where Jesus is explaining kind of this transfer of authority, as you will, uh, from God Almighty to Jesus. And he said that God is his Father. And, of course, the the Jewish folks around him didn't like it, and they said, well, that's, that's why we've got to kill this guy, right? Because he's saying he's God, and he can't be, so we have to kill him. He says, God the Father has given all the authority to, to, to himself, to Jesus. And included in this authority, and I would add the responsibility, is to judge. That's what, what we see Jesus talking about in John 5, 26 and 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Here's the deal. There are consequences for sin. There are consequences for sin. There are consequences for our choices. There's consequences for our choices and for our actions. We have the ability here and now to recognize that and to turn away from those sins in repentance to receive forgiveness and be saved. We also need to know that, that these final judgments are carried out after, after countless opportunities are given to repent. Remember the two witnesses. Remember the 144,000. Remember the angel flying overhead proclaiming the gospel? Remember what we said like, whoa, if an angel came flying over Lebanon and was like, hey, repent and be saved, 
And people were like, ah, stupid angel. <laughs> Countless opportunities. So not just those, but how about these? Times that you have shared your faith. Times that you have shared the gospel with loved ones, with neighbors, with coworkers, with classmates. What about all those opportunities? These judgments are justice. These judgments are justice. I have a very uh, vivid memory when I was a kid. My, my one brother, I have uh, three brothers and a sister. I'm the youngest of five. And the one brother right above me and I, we shared a bedroom for quite a few years because we didn't have a, whatever that would have been, a, however many bedroom house, six bedroom house or whatever because my folks had a room. Um, so we shared a room, and our parents' room was just like, there was a bathroom in between it. That was it. So it was really close. And uh, oftentimes, you know, when we would go to bed, it was, you know, hey, go to bed. Okay, yeah, and we'd be messing around and making noise and wrestling or doing whatever we weren't supposed to be doing. And I remember this one night <clears throat> that we were in there making all kinds of extra noise after we were supposed to be in bed, and and uh, my dad came in and he said, hey guys, time to go to sleep. You gotta, you get, everybody's got school and yada, yada, yada. Okay, dad, no problem. And the door closes and then we're <laughs> jumping around, jumping from bed to bed and all that stuff. Making all kinds of noise. So then he comes in a second time later with a more firm tone. Hey, it's bedtime. I've got to work. Your mother's got to work. You guys got school. It's, it's too late. You need your sleep. Like does all the stuff. Like Okay, Dad, you got it. We got you. So then he closes the door, and then <laughs> pretty soon it escalates. And, and it was, it was uh, this happened a few times, actually. My dad was very uh, patient with, uh, he'd probably laugh if he heard me say that, but he was very patient with this kind of uh, judgment. But then finally I remember very clearly, so there was a, our door would open and the hall light was like behind, like in the hallway. And so I remember the door opening and just the silhouette of my dad in the doorway. And you know how that is when you fold your belt in half and you go snap and you crack it once like that and it makes that snap noise and it was like, ah! And he came in and he hit us each once on the butt with the belt. And we were, okay, gotcha. I am clear on this. So then it was like, you know, we're laying there and it's your fault, it's your fault, shut up. You're going to get, you know. But that was the end of the disobedience, at least that night. We weren't making noise and messing around in the room after that. And that judgment, honestly, that judgment was justice. It was justice. We had ample warnings. We continued to rebel in the face of those warnings. And this is hard, but it's good for us to know that the judgments of God are true and just. The angels say it and confirm it. And that's a hard thing to swallow. It's a very hard thing to swallow. But that's the reason that we have certainty in Christ's finished work on the cross. Does that make sense? If there's not actually right and true judgments that are justice, without that understanding, it doesn't give the power and the weight to the finished work of Christ on the cross. He took my sin and your sin at the cross so that we don't have to. He stood in my place and in your place and took the punishment for that sin, for the sin of the world, for the, the consequences of that sin. And you've heard this line before, grace is free, but it's not cheap. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book about the cost of discipleship, has this quote, the preaching, he's talking about cheap grace, the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. That's cheap grace is what he calls that. And what I'm saying here, and I'm, I'm saying just, judgment is justice, is that we can't be cavalier about sin. We can't. We can't act like sin's not a big deal. We can't look at sin 
like it's not something we need to deal with. There is a judgment for sin. There's a judgment for sin. It's either Jesus in your place or you in your place. But either way, that judgment is justice. The third principle that I see here is the the last part of chapter 16, verses 8 through 21. And this is a principle that you're going to recognize right away. Kindness leads to repentance. Kindness leads to repentance. We're going to work through the next two bowls. Bowls 4 and 5. Remember, we're still pouring out bowls here. Fourth bowl gives the sun the power to scorch people with fire. Think of the worst sunburn you've ever had, then multiply it by a lot. I've had, have you ever had a, a blister on the top of your ear that made your ear stick to your head? Maybe I'm the only one? Okay, I might be the only one that's ever had that. One other guy. Thank you for the solidarity, brother. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. It can happen, I'll just tell you that. It's way worse than that. It's way worse than that. And then the fifth bowl causes darkness to come over the kingdom and the throne of the beast. His image is set up, remember, his image is set up uh, in the temple that will be allowed to be built. And so this is likely now the throne as well. That's kind of the consensus. And this darkness is not just like, oh, this is hard to see. Um, This isn't like, I'm sure glad I've got this smartphone in my pocket with a flashlight function on it. It's not that kind of darkness. It's heavy. It's penetrating. The things I'm, I was reading when they're talking about this is like a, a darkness that you feel. It's like the weight of darkness. It's preventing business as usual in the kingdom of the beast as well. So, quickly before we move past this, I want to recap the condition of things right now as we've seen them, as these last bowls are poured out. People have these ugly, festering sores. They only have blood to drink. They have the worst sunburn imaginable. Now they're being blinded by consuming darkness. This is a terrible time. So they probably repent and receive Christ. No, that's definitely not what the text is telling us. They do not repent. In fact, they curse God. They curse God in the face of these conditions. And we're going to come back to this in a moment. Then we'll look at the sixth bowl. Uh, the sixth bowl does something very interesting. Six bowls poured out, it dries up the Euphrates River. So this stretch of the Euphrates River is 1,800 miles long, uh, three miles wide at points, and it's the natural barrier. You can look at this on the map. It's very interesting. It's a natural barrier between the Far East and the Mideast. Okay? Kind of a natural barrier. Um, you have to go kind of north to get south. It's, it's a very interesting landscape. Uh, when it's dry, it makes possible for these amazingly large armies to come from the far east to the mid-east. This sixth bowl, what it's doing is setting the stage for the final judgment and the final battle of the Great Tribulation. When the sixth bowl is poured out, these demonic spirits that are like frogs are sent out from the members of the counterfeit trinity. And they're sent out to lead these armies to this battle. Um, Jesus steps in with this last reminder in verse 15 as you're looking at this. This is one of the five times that Jesus' return is compared to a thief in the night. And here's what he's saying. In the midst of all this, he's saying, stay vigilant. We have to have an awareness. And Jesus, I think, purposefully puts this phrase right in between the time when these demonic spirits are sent out to influence these kings, to muster these armies. These demonic spirits are going out to convince kings. Jesus is saying, pay attention. Don't fall for this stuff. Don't fall for this stuff. The, other, the second half of that kind of parenthetical word from the Lord there is that he's reinforcing what he's been talking about to the churches in the beginning of the book over and over, that they would receive these new garments or robes of white when they came to him. 
And one of the things I was reading that was really cool, like there's cultural stuff that we just miss that makes so much sense. And it's really, it's beneficial for you to, to learn about these things, to dig in, to find good sources, to dig into some of these cultural things that make so much sense. There would be a, a governor of the temple that would walk around at night. And there was priests that were on duty and things like that, but he would walk around at night with a torch. And, and if he found one of the priests sleeping on the job, I worked shift work for 20 years, okay? I got a lot of naps on night shift, I'll just admit it. Like, I was not scared. Time is right. Things are going well. I'm going to shut it down for a little bit. So this priest would walk around, and if he found people napping on the job, part of it was they would get beat. But then the other part is he would burn their clothes. He would burn their clothes, burn their robes right off of them, take them off, burn them, whatever. So then in the morning, they're naked. And they have to deal with the embarrassment of being found naked in the morning with no clothes interesting tie where folks would just understand this idea of staying awake is being vigilant being aware and that if you're not you're going to be found exposed after this kind of parenthetical word from jesus the seventh bowl is poured out as the armies gather this uh, place called armageddon which just means the hill of megiddo this is a natural battlefield, very natural battlefield. Uh, many battles have been fought there over the course of history. Uh, it's also a strategic location in the, the mountains that run all the way from Turkey down to Tanzania. There's a string of mountains that run the whole way down there, and there's just this one little split in those mountains, and that's right there at Megiddo. Uh, Napoleon. I found a quote from Napoleon about Megiddo, and, and he says, all the armies of the world could maneuver their forces in this vast plain. There is no place in the world more suited for war than this. It is the most natural battleground on the whole earth. That's really interesting to me. And what we see in this seventh bowl, all the armies gather, and it looks at first like these armies are gathered to fight uh, against one another. We're going to look into this in chapter 19, but that's not how it ends up working out. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there. But the seventh bowl, the voice of God from the temple says, it is done. It is done. This was also the experience Jesus had when he took the wrath of God on the cross. When he said, it is finished. The seventh bowl is the final judgment of God. The earthquake that happens is unlike any other so far. We've looked at two other earthquakes in Revelation. And this one will be greater and... and of a higher magnitude than any of them. Mountains crumble, islands go away, and what it means, there's nowhere left to hide. There's nowhere left to hide. All the hiding spots are gone. Ultimate and final judgment is happening in this moment. And even in the face of this, in the face of these 100-pound hailstones, people curse God and do not repent. Just like they did when they got the nasty sores, when the blood was in place of the water, the deadly sun burned, the oppressive darkness, and watching mountains crumble and islands flee. Choosing to curse God rather than repent. This is coming back to that notion that people continued to curse God in the face of these bold judgments. And we understand why when we understand this this principle that Paul wrote about in Romans 2, 4, and 5. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. People don't repent because things get hard. People don't repent because things get hard. Spurgeon had a quote about this section of Scripture. And he said, One truth, however, comes out of this passage more plainly than any other to my mind, and it is this, that judgments, even the most terrible of them, do not in themselves produce a satisfactory repentance in the minds of men. It's a principle that runs all through Scripture. This is why we need to know and understand that God is a righteous judge. And that there will be a time when his judgment comes on the earth. 
Like Peter said in his second letter as he's talking about the heart of the Lord towards all people, that he's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This repentance doesn't come from judgment. By the time this judgment comes, it's too late for that. People are not wired to respond in repentance to judgment. James talked about this too in uh, James 1, 19 and 20. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All the righteous anger that we can muster all of the, I know I'm right and I'm angry about it because I'm right. All of that does not produce the righteousness of God. And I think the application for this is twofold. And you have to figure out where you're at to know how this applies. If you know Jesus, are you quick to hear and slow to speak? Or have you flipped that around? Are you quick to speak and slow to hear? Are you displaying the kindness of God in relationships in your life that leads to repentance? Or are you seeing people turn away from God because of judgment in your life? Or turn towards Him because of kindness? What are you seeing? What are you seeing in your life? Secondly, if you're here, or if maybe, you're, maybe you're watching this on YouTube, like and subscribe. But maybe you're watching this video, maybe somebody shared it with you. Is your heart growing harder towards God? Is your heart growing harder towards God? Or are you seeing the kindness of the Lord through His people? This kindness is, is meant to lead you to repentance and to salvation. That's the purpose. My, my word to you is to take advantage of His kindness through the conviction. Don't wait for judgment. Because Jesus already took that on the cross. That's the good news. That's how we fold all this together at the end of the day. We fold all of these principles, all of this that we covered today, this big step we took today, it all folds together when we understand that these judgments that are right and true have been poured out on Christ on the cross. In my place, in your place, for all of the sin of the world. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. It's this sacrificial atonement that we talk about. This is the good news of the gospel that there's only one provision for salvation and God who is holy had to provide it because we can't. And He provided Jesus. Jesus takes the wrath, takes the punishment, takes the sin, goes to the cross, and as he said, it is finished. Finishes the work. And ours is to recognize that it's our sin that separates us from God and to turn away from that sin in repentance. Not because we've experienced judgment, but because we recognize the kindness of God that leads us then to repentance. I'm going to have the worship team come up. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Thank You that Your kindness gave us the opportunity to repent. Thank You that, as we talked about, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And Lord, that You gave us that option. That You provided a way. And so Lord, I pray this final application point today. Kindness leads to repentance. God, help each one of us to examine ourselves where we are at. Am I a Christian who has been 
slow to hear and quick to speak. God, if that's the case, change that in me. Help me be slow to speak and quick to hear. Help me represent you to this lost world around me. And God, if, if there's some here or watching that, that don't know you, Lord, please expose the kindness that leads to repentance to them. Do a great work in their hearts. Help them understand that this judgment is right and true, but that you took it on the cross in their place. And that they would recognize that and turn away from that sin that separates them in repentance and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.